Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. It is December 18th, 2019, the 20th day of Kislev, 5780. And I'm on the second week of a trip now to the States. First week was family wedding, going to a camera event in New York, spending some time with my husband, who, uh, who came with me, uh, seeing a wonderful play, Come From Away, on Broadway, and, uh, and also doing something for Winnesville Fund in, in Woodmere. But I drove down to the Washington, D.C. area yesterday. It was pouring rain and foggy. Today happens to be beautiful. Um, to, uh, to do some things in this area now until I go home on, on Sunday when you'll be listening to this podcast. And uh, I'm sitting now with Dr. Rafael Medoff, noted historian, director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C., author of numerous books about America's response to the Holocaust. And specifically, uh, he graciously agreed to the interview today um, to talk about his newest book, the Jews should keep quiet. So, Dr. Medoff, uh, thank you so much for sitting with me today. Hi, Eve. Glad to be with you. Okay, so this is an interesting title for a book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. So tell us a little bit about uh, your latest publication. Well, the phrase, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is a close paraphrase of something which President Franklin Roosevelt repeatedly said to Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, the foremost American Jewish leader in that era, um, during their occasional meetings over the years. Um, it's also what Wise often then transmitted to members of the American Jewish community who were considering protesting against uh, Roosevelt's policies toward Jewish refugees. So in other words, you have a kind of a tragic chain here where the President of the United States pressured the leading um, Jewish figure in the U.S., to refrain from speaking out about U.S. policy during the Holocaust, U.S. policy toward the Jews in Europe during that period. And then some Jewish leaders like Wise, in turn, trying to keep the more uh, militant elements of the Jewish community from speaking out. So what was the U.S. policy during World War II towards the Jews who were trying to flee uh, the Nazis in Europe? President Roosevelt's policy... Um, is best summed up in the title of the definitive study of uh, the American response to the Holocaust, The Abandonment of the Jews. That was the title of Professor David Wyman's best-selling 1984 book, which really remains the gold standard in scholarship about the period. The essence of Professor Wyman's findings and findings of other scholars since was that the United States, that is the Roosevelt administration, had numerous opportunities to rescue Jewish refugees during the 1930s and the 1940s, and yet deliberately chose not to act on those opportunities and tried to close America's doors as tightly as possible to Jewish refugees who were seeking admission. So, of course, the, this begs the question, why? And that is the question at the heart of this new book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. It's a question that has haunted me as a historian for decades, because most of the uh, previous scholarship on this subject, while revealing the basic facts of the story, have never been able to get to the heart of the question, why? Why did Roosevelt take this position, which at, at first glance seems to be so much at odds with his public image? You know, he ran for president the first time in 1932, um, presenting himself as the champion of the little per, of the little guy, the for, of the forgotten guy, um, that was kind of a soundbite that he and his campaign aides developed, and that was his public persona that he was a a broad minded, liberal minded humanitarian. And yet, when it came to the fate of the Jews uh, in, Ger in Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied Europe, uh, Roosevelt showed uh, no interest, or, or almost no interest, let's say. Um, during those tragic years. But this is more than just not showing interest. There were quotas that the United States had for accepting Jewish refugees, not very large numbers to begin with, and even they weren't filled. And I remember my grandparents, I mean, my grandfather died when I was 16, which is a while back, but in the few conversations that I had with him, and I wasn't a politically aware young teenager, I, I remember distinctly him think he and his generation feeling that FDR was the most incredible thing that had happened to the Jewish people. So why is there such a disparity between the image that people had? And this, we're talking, he died in 1977. So we're talking for decades after the war and the reality. 
Well, American Jewish support for President Roosevelt was, um, was very substantial. According to the, the polls at the time, it seems that in the range of 90% of American Jews voted for FDR every time. In hindsight, that does seem perplexing given what we know about Roosevelt's abandonment of European Jews. But the key word here is hindsight. Much of what we are discussing now was not known to average American Jews at the time in the 30s and 40s. It was known to Jewish leaders, Rabbi Stephen Wise and other leaders of major Jewish organizations. And that, that raises an interesting and complicated question about the disparity between what Jewish leaders knew and what they shared with the rest of the community. But as to the, the, the basic question, why did Jews vote for Roosevelt in such large numbers? Well, we start with the fact that they simply didn't realize um, that there were so many opportunities to rescue refugees. They didn't know um, the extra steps that the Roosevelt administration took, for example, to keep refugees out. Um, and and you, uh, you alluded a moment ago to the issue of the quotas never being filled. That takes us back to the heart of this question, why? Why go out of their way? Why did the administration go out of its way to suppress the level of Jewish immigration below what the law already allowed? Now, America's immigration system um, during that period had been enacted um, into law in the early 1920s. It was a quota system based on national origins, meaning that there was a specific number, a maximum number of people from any one country who could, in theory, immigrate to the U.S. each year. Irrespective of their religion, just their whatever country they were coming out of. Right. The, the quota for Germany, for example, was about 26,000 in the 1930s. Now, the vast majority of German citizens seeking admission to the U.S. then were, in fact, Jews, although not all of them. But because of the Nazi persecution, most Germans who were fleeing were Jews fleeing from Nazi anti-Semitism. So the quota was 26,000. It increased a little bit after Germany annexed Austria in 1938. Then it was, we brought it close to 28,000. But that figure was filled only one time during FDR's 12 years in office. From 1933 to 1945, the annual quota from Germany was filled only once. Um, and in, in most of the year, of the, of the 11 years when it was not filled, it was less than 25% filled. So 75% of the available quota places in each of those years um, were simply not used. Now, immigration quota places, visas, did not, um, if they were not used, they did not roll over into the next year. They were simply thrown in the wastebasket. If you add up all the unused quota places from Germany and then later from German-occupied countries in Europe from 33 to 45, the total number is about 200,000. In other words, 200,000 visas that were simply unused. This, this uh, number, this phenomenon is important for several reasons. First of all, when sometimes when we hear public um, discussions about Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust, those who defend his track record will say that there was so much anti-Semitism at the time, so much public opposition to immigration, so much congressional opposition to immigration, that Roosevelt's hands were tied. Now, it's certainly true that um, the public was overwhelmingly opposed to more immigration. And that's really not surprising because we're talking about the period of the Great Depression. So people were afraid of foreigners coming and taking jobs away from American citizens. Um, so that's, that's part of it. And it's also true that Congress was overwhelmingly anti-immigration. So it was not realistic for, um, to suggest that, that FDR could have gone to Congress and requested and, and succeeded in passing a liberalization of the quota system. But when we realize that there were 200,000 unused visas within the existing quota system, then that whole defense of FDR really falls apart. Because we're not really arguing about whether or not he could have um, defied public opinion, defied Congress. What, we're, what we realize is that he did not have to start a big public debate about immigration. He did not have to start a fight with Congress. He didn't have to risk his own political future by doing something unpopular. All he had to do was quietly tell the government officials, and in those days it was the State Department, the government officials in charge of immigration to allow the existing quotas to be filled, to simply honor the law as it was. So why did the administration go so above and beyond the quotas? Why did they 
suppress immigration so far below the levels that the existing law would have allowed. And incidentally, I should add, it was not just Germany, but Poland also. The, the quota from Poland. It was small, but it was never filled during all those years. So these are, these are the questions that, um, that have um, captivated me since my earliest days as a historian. Um, why go that far? And there are other similar questions, which again, earlier historians did not address. Uh, other, other instances in which the president and his, um, his administration went far beyond what the law allowed. I'll give you another example. Sometimes we hear, and in fact, FDR and his aides said at the time, there were no ships available to bring Jewish refugees to America or any place else. It was the middle of a war, and all ships were needed for the war effort. And that was, a, that was an effective argument by the president and his spokesman at the time, because that's very intimidating. For a Jewish leader to say, why not let some more Jews into the U.S. It was to escape the Nazis, and to be told, well, we need those ships for the war effort, well, then it's almost like, um, it's almost, you know, unpatriotic to say, no, use the ships for refugees. But here's the astounding reality. There were ships called Liberty ships, which were used to bring American soldiers and uh, military equipment to Europe. After they unloaded this cargo, um, typically in England, later France, um, the ships were empty. And they returned to the United States empty. Because they were empty, the ships were extremely light. They had it to be weighed down with rubble, what, what they call ballast, um, chunks of concrete, in order to keep the boats from capsizing. That's how light they were. And some Jewish refugee advocates at the time pointed out that um, they might just as easily have loaded them down with Jewish refugees. The ships were returning empty. And yet they were never used for a humanitarian purpose, even though they could have been without detracting from the war effort. So again, we have an otherwise inexplicable phenomenon. Um, they were told, Jew, Jewish groups were told that the ships were needed exclusively for the war effort. Um, but in fact, they returned empty and could have brought refugees without detracting from the war effort one iota. So what you're describing is a deliberate effort to not bring refugees in from Europe. I mean, I'm sitting here taking this very personally because my father was born in Berlin in 1932. They got out to Jerusalem in 1933, so he was saved. But the rest of his extended family did not. They, they were killed by the Nazis. Uh, so I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my God. I mean, and I'm not the only one. Why were these people not allowed to flee Europe? Let me add one more example. Perhaps the most famous aspect of America's uh, response or non-response to the Holocaust is the question of the failure to bomb the Auschwitz death camp or the railways and bridges leading to the camp. This was a proposal which was made by many Jewish organizations privately to the Roosevelt administration in the summer and autumn of 1944. The reason though the proposals began at that point was because in the spring of 44, two escapees from Auschwitz um, reached Slovakia and provided to Jewish leaders there and then to American diplomats, um, Western diplomats in Europe, provided them with detailed maps of Auschwitz. They explained, the escapees explained the details of the mass murder process and drew maps which showed um, ex the exact location of the crematoria and the gas chambers. With this information um, in the hands of of uh, American Jewish leaders and other Jewish leaders starting in the spring of 44, there began a series of, of private requests to the Roosevelt administration to hit the targets on, on these maps or, at a minimum, to strike the railways and bridges leading to the camp. The reason that particular idea of the railways came up was because in the spring of 1944, the Germans began the mass deportation of Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz. Hungary had been the last country in Europe with a major Jewish community that had been untouched by the Nazis. It was occupied by the Germans in March 1944, and soon after that, deportations began. So um, an, an important fact about the Hungarian deportations is that they really took place before the eyes of the world. Unlike earlier phases of the Holocaust, which the Germans went to great pains to hide, uh, 
and therefore were not known immediately in the free world, the deportations from Hungary uh, were carried out at a time when there were still um, there were the Western journalists in the area and diplomats and, and other sources. So you can actually read in the New York Times um, in the spring of 1944 uh, accounts, uh, detailed accounts of how the Jews were being deported and they were going to be sent to a death camp uh, in Poland called Aswisim, as they called it in the Times, um, where they're going to be killed by poison gas. It was, it was in the paper almost in real time. So with that secret out, and with the information about, about Auschwitz having reached the hands of Jewish leaders um, in New York and Washington, the request for bombing began. Now, so if you bomb the railroad lines, then the Jews can't get to Auschwitz. So that would at least keep them from getting into the crematoria and into the gas chambers. There is in Yad Vashem, and some of my listeners who've been there, I guide there all the time, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. There's a very large aerial photo of Auschwitz on the wall showing that the, the Farben factory right near Auschwitz was bombed by the Americans. And it's like two clicks, you know, right there is Auschwitz. And the big question, of course, is why didn't the Americans do that? So this is a remarkable aspect of the story, and this will take us back again to the question of why did the administration go out of its way um, not to help the Jews? <clears throat> so when requests were made to the administration to bomb the railways to disrupt the, the transportation of the Jews to Auschwitz um, or to hit bridges, which would have taken even longer to repair and thus would have interrupted the process even more um, uh, substantially, they received a response which was the equivalent of a form letter. And I say a form letter because um, the, essentially the same letter with the same identical language would, was sent each time back to the officials of the World Jewish Congress and other groups that raised the bombing issue. And what the letter said was that, um, that the War Department, today it's called the Defense Department, but the War Department um, had carried out essentially a feasibility study had studied this question of whether or not um, the, the camp or the railways could be bombed, and it concluded that it was not uh, possible because it would require diverting American planes away from battle zones. Almost every word of, the, of these rejection letters, almost every word of it was a lie. We know from uh, um, research by historians in all the relevant archives over many decades, there was no feasibility study done. They never studied it. We also know from Professor Wyman's research, and he explains this in his book, The Abandonment of the Jews, we know that, um, as you just mentioned, the, the oil factories operated by IG Farben, which were part of the Auschwitz complex, which is a couple of miles from the gas chambers, that those oil factories were repeatedly bombed by the Americans and also to a lesser extent by the British um, during the summer and autumn of 1944. Elie Wiesel, by the way, as a teenager, was one of the slave laborers who was imprisoned in those um, and, and worked in those synthetic oil factories. The reason the Allies were hitting the oil factories is because they were considered a legitimate military target. But the mass murder of 12,000 Jews every single day in an adjacent location was not considered a legitimate or worthwhile target. Wiesel talks in his book, Night, about how he and the other prisoners saw the American planes flying overhead and were praying that they would drop the bombs, even though, Wiesel said, they knew that they could be killed in the bombings. But he said they, they all expected to be, um, to be murdered by the Germans any day, and they knew that the mass murder process was going on every day in the gas chamber section of the camp, Beer Canal. So they prayed for the bombs to be dropped. And the bombs were dropped, of course, but only on the oil factories a few miles away. So this brings us to a, to a perplexing question, again, which has not really been um, addressed by previous uh, historians of, the, of this subject, which is, why did the War Department, the Roosevelt administration, why did it make up these uh, false excuses and false reasons for not bombing the camps or not bombing the railways? They did, not, they did not undertake a feasibility study, so why did they claim that they did? Um, they would not have had to divert planes from battle zones because the planes were right there already bombing the oil factory. So why make up all of this? And as a young historian, this question perplexed me because um, in, in my experience, um, 
when a when a government official makes up some reason and it's clearly a, clearly false that means the real reason is something which is somehow embarrassing or unpopular and they're, they're so they're hiding the real motivation but clearly the motivation that they that they stated were not true so to sum up here we have a series of um otherwise bewildering actions taken by the roosevelt administration during this period suppressing immigration far below what the existing law allowed refusing to use ships that were empty to bring jewish refugees to haven in the u.s um, not dropping a few bombs from planes that were already flying over auschwitz to each of these um each of these disturbing questions uh ultimately all emanate from the same source. This is what I concluded, and this is the case that I lay out in my new book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. That ultimately, um, the, the reasons for uh, President Roosevelt's attitude and for his abandonment of the Jews ultimately reach back to a significant extent to his personal attitudes towards Jews and also towards other minority groups. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the strongest clue that led me down the path of this research came not from uh, histories of the Holocaust, but rather from an important book concerning the internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II. Now, as we know, President Roosevelt in early 1942 authorized the mass detention of more than 130,000 Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. none of whom had been captured um, engage in espionage for Japan, but all of whom were considered in Roosevelt's eyes to be suspect that they could not be trusted simply by virtue of their ancestry. They had immigrated from Japan or their parents had immigrated from Japan, and therefore um, Roosevelt and his advisors concluded that they were uh, potentially uh, disloyal. So this now has to do with the Pacific Theater, right? With the, the, what originally brings America into the war before they're fighting the Nazis, which is, of course, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor and everything that's going on in the Pacific. And the main internment is happening on the West Coast, correct? In California? Or not only? Most of the Japanese Americans lived in California, and there were some detention camps there, but some of them were in other parts of the country as far away, for example, as Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, Italian-Americans were never put in detention camps, even though America was at war with Italy. German Americans were never put in detention camps, even though there was substantial evidence that at least some German Americans were indeed sympathetic to the Nazis. They were never put in detention camps. So this was a, um, a mystery that was um, explored by a historian named Greg Robinson, who teaches in Canada. He's an American historian, and he wrote a very important book about 15 years ago called By Order of the President. And he set out um, to, to explore a dilemma very similar to the dilemma that I've just outlined about Roosevelt's attitude towards the Jews and the Holocaust. And that was, Roosevelt was, by reputation, a liberal, um, big-hearted humanitarian, uh, a champion of civil liberties, presumably. How in the world could he strip 130,000 American citizens of their civil liberties, um, forcing them to sell off all of their property for pennies, um, and spending years in detention camps, uh, sometimes in the, in the swamps of Arkansas and in the bitter cold of, um, in, in Utah, Northern California during the winter and so forth. Professor Robinson found the answer to the question of why, he, why Roosevelt interned the Japanese um, in a series of, of long-forgotten articles that FDR had written in the 1920s. This was during the period in his life when Roosevelt was afflicted with polio and was spending a good deal of time in Warm Springs, Georgia. During that period of recuperation, he was a columnist for a local newspaper and wrote articles for other, other publications. <clears throat> Keep in mind, this was not Roosevelt as a teenager. What I'm about to describe were not like offhand, some offhand comment he made or when he was you know, young and irresponsible or drunk. He was, in fact, already a veteran politician. Um, in the 1920s, he had already been the 1920 Democratic vice presidential candidate, unsuccessfully. This is just before he ran for and won, um, ran for governor of New York. So he was already a mature man and a seasoned politician with um, firmly held views on a number of subjects, including, it turns out, um, 
very strong opinions on immigration and extremely what we must categorize as racist opinions about Asian Americans, whom he referred to as Orientals. So in a series of articles at the time, um, he addressed the question of uh, Asian, especially Japanese immigration to the U.S. It happens to have been a, a kind of a hot button topic. He wrote a number of columns about it for this newspaper in Macon, Georgia, and also um, for several foreign policy magazines. And in these articles, he argued that, um, that Japanese were, um, were incapable of fully assimilating and becoming full Americans, that they were, um, by race, they were loyal to their own race and to their emperor, that they couldn't be fully trusted, that they should not be allowed to own property in California, that uh, marriages between Orientals and whites were a terrible idea, very dangerous, um, and other, other statements of that sort. So what Professor Robinson discovered was that um, Franklin Roosevelt had very, um, very strong um, anti-Asian opinions, very strong hostile opinions about a large you know, ethnic community in the United States. He didn't believe they could ever be trusted. They couldn't be real Americans. So where's the press on this, though? 130,000 people is a lot of people. Where is there an outcry at the time among the, the media here in the United States? Not so much among the media. Some, um, some liberal Americans did protest. The ACLU uh, f- tried to fight it in court. But for most of the public, it was wartime. People were scared. The Japanese had bombed Hawaii, and there were constant rumors that they would soon bomb California. Mm-hmm. So that the idea that there was a fifth column of Japanese, uh, people of Japanese origin who might secretly be loyal to the enemy was something that, that took hold. And, and thanks to the support of public opinion, FDR was able to maintain this policy of keeping them in detention camps. Now, what does this have to do with the Jews? Well, as I read the statements that Roosevelt made about the Japanese, I began to notice a disturbing parallel to statements he had made in private about Jews. How do you know the statements that he made in private? So some presidents um, have left an ample record of their private thoughts. Uh, the most obvious example is Richard Nixon, whose uh, tape recordings of his own Oval Office conversations mm-hmm. became a goldmine for historians. We know a lot about Nixon's attitudes about a lot of things, including about Jews. Um, we know a good deal about Harry Truman's private opinions about Jews because there were periods where he kept a diary, which many years later was discovered. Um, now, Roosevelt was a very canny politician, and he was very... Uh, careful in general not to commit his private thoughts to paper. So we do not have tape recordings of him saying the things I'm about to describe, um, and we don't have any diary in which he wrote them down. But what we do have, which historians, um, not just me, uh, but historians have discovered over the years, were a series of comments he made in private conversations with other people who then wrote them down. Now, these are not... um, these are not um, just uh, rumors or fragments, but these are uh, detailed records made by people who were allies of the president mm-hmm. and, um, and were not, did not write them down in order to use them against the president. These remained private. They were in archives. So some of the comments came, come from um, members of Congress with whom the Roosevelt was close and with whom he was having off-the-record conversations, and they then simply wrote it down in their, in their own um, archives, their own records, just for the record, um, but not intending them for publication, not to hurt the president. Some of the comments I'm about to describe um, were made, believe it or not, to Henry Morgenthau Jr., Roosevelt's own Secretary of the Treasury. There are comments um, as well that Roosevelt made at the Casablanca Conference, which was a meeting between Roosevelt and his advisors and, um, and local leaders following the, um, the Allied liberation of North Africa. Uh, in early, in, in this was a, the conference took place in early 1943. They were discussing um, uh, how the Allies would govern the newly liberated areas, Morocco, Algeria, um, uh, Libya. There were more than 300,000 Jews living in those Arab countries. Um, before the Allies liberated the area, uh, many of those Jews had been um, put into slave labor camps, were, were bitterly, you know, violently persecuted, both by local Arabs and by the Vichy uh, 
French, the Nazis' allies who had been ruling in the area. So the, the Casablanca Conference, among other things, there were private discussions, but we have transcripts of them, actual transcripts, because these were official American government meetings, so there were note takers. In those discussions, they're talking about, among other things at one point, um, what should the status of the Jews be uh, in, the, in, the post, in the post-liberation period? Because the Jews had been stripped of their rights, they were put in these camps and so forth. Um, and there we find President Roosevelt, this is early 1943, saying that um, there needed to be very strict quotas placed on, allow, on whether or not, uh, on a number of these Jews who would be allowed into professions, law, medicine, and so forth, that they had to be strictly limited, he said. Otherwise, there would be a, a strong um, negative reaction from the locals, that is, from the Arabs. So he's and not then, even talking about Jews immigrating to the United States and, and being limited. He's talking about them staying in these countries, yet imposing some kind of restrictions on what they could do. Yes, and it goes further um, in a very tragic way. In explaining why it was important to impose these quotas on the, on the Jews in Arab countries, he said, um, you don't want to have a situation here which will be similar to what happened in Germany, where the Jews were a, a very small percentage of the population, but they were more than half, he said, of the lawyers and doctors and professors. And that, he said, gave rise to the understandable reaction, his words, the understandable reaction of the Germans to this Jewish domination. So Jewish success in societies it ends up causing anti-Semitism. In this case, you have the President of the United States, an educated man, presumably of liberal sensibilities, um, looking at the situation of not in Nazi Germany, the persecution of the Jews, and seeing it as a kind of understandable, almost justified reaction to what he saw as the Jewish over, you know, Jewish domination of certain German professions and German culture. It happens that his statistics were way off, but that's not even, even the point. The mm-hmm. point is he believed it. <clears throat> he believed that the Jews in Germany kind of, in a sense, sort of deserved the anger and violence that they, in his mind, provoked because they were too dominant in German society. Now, that in itself is an extremely disturbing comment. And if that had been the only comment Roosevelt ever made about Jews at that time, then historians would kind of scratch their heads in wonder. And, and if you look at some of the early works, um, the early histories of this period, you will find historians mentioning that particular comment and kind of not knowing what to make of it. What I began to discover in my research, um, and some other historians also began to discover over the last 10 years or so, was that Roosevelt made a number of remarks in private in which again and again he kind of hit on the same theme that you can't let the Jews become too dominant or they will, um, they will endanger the society and where they're living. I found, for example, a conversation he had with Rabbi Wise in 1937. The, the subject was the mistreatment of Jews in Poland. There was a, excuse me, a great deal of anti-Semitism in Poland in the 1930s. So at one point, Rabbi Wise went to the president to talk about, not about the Jews in Germany, but about the Jews in Poland and was there anything that could be done. By the way, the quota of Polish immigrants to the U.S. in that year was, of course, mostly unfilled. So at a minimum, they could have taken in more Polish Jews. But um, when, Rose, when, when Wise raised the issue of the mistreatment of the Jews in Poland, FDR responded that, well, that's because the Jews dominate the economy. So naturally, Poles are, are mad at them. Yeah, so that's another example. Altogether, there are about 15 such statements that Roosevelt made to different parties, in different contexts, from the 1930s all the way through 1943, 44. But they all kind of hit the same thing. You can't let, you can't have too many Jews in certain professions. You can't allow them to become prominent in the culture. You can't allow them to, to live, to concentrate in any particular area. There are several comments where he specifically talks about the danger of allowing too many Jews to live in a particular geographic location. Um, there's a conversation with Secretary Morgenthau, and Morgenthau record, recorded this in his private papers, a conversation where Roosevelt boasted about how when he, FDR, was on the board of trustees of Harvard University in the 1920s, that he helped impose a quota on the admission of Jewish students to Harvard because he said you didn't want to have too many Jews coming in and influencing and dominating the culture on campus. So it, it seemed to me 
and this is what I lay out in The Jews Should Keep Quiet in, in much more detail, is that we have a pattern um, that Roosevelt again and again returned to this same theme, the, the same idea about Jews and also about the Jap- Japanese Americans. Same kinds of things that, were, that they were ultimately, they, could not, they would not fully assimilate, they could not be fully trusted, that they had to be limited in different ways, um, otherwise they would be harmful to America. So his overall vision, Franklin Roosevelt's overall vision of what America should look like was one that would be overwhelmingly white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, with small numbers of minority groups like Jews and, and Asians, uh, but in small numbers, in very small numbers. That Do you have any idea where this comes from, given like his childhood, his background? Does this come from a religious place? Does it come from some incidents that happened to him? Is there any idea about how he develops into, uh, I'm going to say it flat out, somewhat of a racist? Uh, books about President Roosevelt's family, <clears throat> his parents, siblings, half-siblings, etc., um, have cited many examples in which in his home um, there was a great deal of prejudice against Jews and, and other minorities. Um, the kind of prejudice that you would, I guess, expect from you know, uh, upper-class uh, white Protestants uh, in the Northeast, mm-hmm. of the United States, in the early 1900s. So in a sense, it's not entirely surprising. Of course, not everybody was an anti-Semite or a racist. Not, you know, it wasn't inevitable that he had to um, imbibe these ideas. Moreover, you know, for many people have, let's say, parents who might harbor some kind of prejudice. It doesn't mean you have to then accept it. Um, mm-hmm. Roosevelt was an educated man. Um, he was uh, smart enough, I would say, to understand um, that, that racism, anti-Semitism um, were, were vile ideas. But from his perspective, they were not vile. From his uh, from what he learned in at home, and perhaps from what he thought he observed in the world around him, he came to accept a, a number of very ugly stereotypes about Jews, um, about Asians, um, also about others, about African Americans. There's very ugly language in some of his private comments referring to Afri- African Americans as well. So we're talking here about a man who understood that racism and anti-Semitism were not widely accepted in public discourse. They were not. He kept them behind, you know, behind closed doors. Um, most politicians did. There were exceptions, of course, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism in America in those days. But still, the, um, the idea that uh, Jews or other minorities deserve to be hated or victimized, these were not ideas that were um, acceptable in the public realm um, in the United States at the time. And yet, many people harbored these sentiments privately. You would wish that your, your president did not harbor such sentiment, but more to the point, you would wish that he did not allow his prejudice to influence policy. Earlier, we referred to uh, Richard Nixon and Harry Truman, and one could make the case that even though privately they said many disparaging things about Jews, that there's no evidence that it actually affected any of their policies towards Jews or toward Israel. Well, Truman is the first to recognize the state of Israel 11 minutes after in 1948, uh, despite whatever it is that he thinks privately. What's so overwhelmingly shocking in what you're saying here and what you lay out um, really so well in your book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is that he took his personal prejudices, put them into American foreign policy, and as a result, many Jews died who wouldn't have had to die. I mean, the Japanese Americans, first of all, they're here already and they're interned. I'm assuming that they didn't have a wonderful few years, but they didn't end up in gas chambers. So looking at it from a Jewish perspective, and again, from a very personal perspective of someone who had family there, this is what is like to wrap our minds around what the American president went against really a, a American policy in terms of the quotas, et cetera, um, and prevented the saving of, at least, as you said, even if just the basic quotas have been filled, 200,000 Jews uh, from Nazi Germany. Now, to be clear, a lot of factors go into presidential decision-making. And I am not suggesting that uh, Roosevelt's private prejudice against Jews was the only uh, factor in mm-hmm. the process we're talking about. The Obviously, State Department has never been a friend of the Jewish people. I assume they had some say in here, too. Well, the president did surround himself um, with a number of senior officials who were unquestionably anti-Semitic. And we know that from the documents. Mm-hmm. Um, the State Department, as you mentioned, 
um, was filled with, uh, with uh, uh, bureaucrats, officials um, who privately were, were quite anti-Semitic. We know it from their, from their private diaries and their private correspondence. Roosevelt did, of course, have a number of Jewish advisors, and we've mentioned he had one Jewish cabinet member. Um, however, only a certain type of Jew could rise to the inner circle of, of Franklin Roosevelt. That was the kind of Jew who never brought up Jewish concerns or Jewish issues. So although there were men like uh, Bernard Baruch and uh, Felix Frankfurter, the Supreme Court Justice, and uh, Ben Cohen, um, one of the architects of the New Deal, and um, Samuel Rosenman, uh, the president's chief uh, speechwriter and Jewish advisor, and of course Henry Morgenthau. Mm-hmm. Although these men were all Jewish, um, they almost never um, brought up any Jewish concerns to the president. They felt it was not their place. They were afraid of being accused of of only caring about their narrow ethnic interests. So those were the kind of Jews um, who were in Roosevelt's inner circle. But at the same time, there were uh, many officials who were uh, unquestionably hostile to the idea of allowing more Jews into the U.S. or or taking any steps to interrupt the mass murder process. So Roosevelt had a kind of a self-reinforcing circle around him that also helped ensure what we call the abandonment of the Jews. So there's a community in Israel that's named for Morgenthau, which means morning dew, and there's a community called Tal Shachar that was just on my mind because one of the trips that I'm planning for the end of January, we're going to have lunch there. There's a phenomenal dairy restaurant there in Tal Shachar, and it's named for Morgenthau. So at some point he was helpful enough to the fledgling state of Israel that they named a community after him. But he surrounded himself, he put a little echo chamber around him for the most part. Is this where some of your... Because you had, you had many choices for a title for your book. And the Jews Should Keep Quiet is focusing on the other side of it, is not just on, on FDR and the people around him and what he ends up doing and not doing. But where the Jews fit in here, the ones who could have said something, didn't say anything. And, um, and, and what you mentioned a few minutes ago is why the leaders, the Jewish leaders of America at the time, did not tell the people, the Jewish people, what was happening here, why they knew this and kept so much of it secret. Look, no president likes being criticized. So it's not surprising that President Roosevelt would repeatedly try to get a Jewish leader like Stephen Wise um, to hold back, to refrain from disagreeing with any of his policies. um, But at the same time, one must consider the fact that it was Wise's job to represent Jewish concerns. So um, he's not one of the inner circle of FDR who's doing American policy. He's there as you have Jewish Americans who have a job to do for America. And then you have Jewish Americans who are supposed to represent the Jewish community. And that was Wise. He wasn't Morgenthau. So where is he on this? The problems that um, I found in my research regarding Rabbi Wise are in many ways um, phenomena that we see in um, leaders of American Jewish organizations um, in almost every generation. Right up until this very minute. Uh, And for example, uh, the fact that Wise was not democratically elected um, is, is something which we also find in today's American Jewish community where almost none of the leaders of the American Jewish organizations, the presumed spokespeople for American Jewry, almost none of them are democratically elected. Um, and, um, or in a few cases, they have a kind of a rubber stamp election, but nothing that really qualifies as democracy. So this, this became a problem for American Jewry during the period we're talking about, the 30s and 40s, because Jews who were dissatisfied with Rabbi Wise's leadership didn't really have any options. They couldn't vote someone else into power. And Rabbi Wise like a lot of Jewish leaders today, was very reluctant to ever share his power or his prominence. He was not willing to allow um, younger, more dynamic, more activist-minded um, figures in the Jewish community to be part of the leadership of the Jewish community. And this is despite the fact that Wise um, was, during the period we're talking about, Wise was um, getting on in years. He was in his late 60s um, uh, at a time when the, um, the average life expectancy for American males was late 60s. Um, he had serious health problems for the entire period we're talking about. When I examined his private correspondence um, throughout his entire life, I found that uh, during the 1930s and 1940s, when he really needed to be at the top of his game, 
Um, he was constantly afflicted with all sorts of illnesses um, and sometimes just pure exhaustion. When I say exhaustion, we should note that Wise was simultaneously the head of the American Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress, the Zionist Organization of America, um, a synagogue, um, the Free Synagogue in Manhattan, um, and a rabbinical training institute, the uh, Jewish Institute of Religion. So here's a man who was spread incredibly thin and yet was not willing to allow anyone else to come in and share the limelight because, and this again is a, is a contemporary problem, because in some ways he became drunk on the, on, on the prominence that he enjoyed and the power he believed that it gave him. Now, the sad, the sad reality is that um, prominence and access do not always equal influence or power, which is to say, yes, Wise was occasionally allowed um, the, um, the, a meeting at the White House, but we find almost no instance, there are one or two exceptions, but almost no instance in which Roosevelt at all took his advice seriously, was interested in what he had to say. Um, now, where is the responsibility to his own people? I mean, if you have access and power, it's supposed to be to help whomever it is that you're representing. Yet this looks like a very big fail at a critical juncture in Jewish history. Rabbi Wise was an ardent supporter of President Roosevelt's domestic agenda. Wise was a loyal Democrat. He was a passionate New Dealer. Um, he saw Roosevelt as almost like a, a messiah, mm -hmm. that is, a, someone who would save, save the country from the Great Depression. Um, and, and by the way, in my remarks uh, on this subject, I am not discounting what mm -hmm. FDR did um, in terms of leading America out of the Depression and obviously leading America um, in World War II. But the problem for Wise was that... Um, was that he was conflicted. He knew, and we see this from his private correspondence, we, he knew that there was much that, could, that Roosevelt could do to help the Jews that wasn't being done. And yet at the same time, he desperately did not want to see anything done by those in the Jewish community um, that could hurt Roosevelt politically. So Wise never, during the entire 12 years that we're talking about, he never once um, a publicly challenged Roosevelt's uh, refugee policy, even though Wise knew that the quotas were not being filled. So his loyalty to Roosevelt weighed, was g giving greater weight than his loyalty to the Jewish people? You could say that, because again and again, um, Wise knew the truth about Roosevelt, but did not share that with the Jewish community. He never went back to, um, to other Jewish leaders or to the Jewish community at large to say, you know, the administration, you know, is, is abandoning the Jews or, or anything even remotely like that. He, he, he saw himself in many ways as Roosevelt's protector. Um, he, what he told American Jews about Roosevelt was essentially intended to soothe them, to assure them that the president was doing all he could um, and that therefore there was no reason for alarm and no reason for anybody to protest. Now, there were elements in the Jewish community that would not accept um, that line. Um, that could not be reassured because they, they, they were convinced that there must be something that the U.S. could do. Well, you had like the screenwriter Ben Hecht and you had other people, the Bergsons. I mean, you had pe Bergson Group. You had people who were raising a call and saying something is very wrong here. And this was a source of great anguish for Rabbi Wise. When the Bergson Group, mm -hmm. uh, including Ben Hecht, began, for example, sponsoring full-page newspaper ads calling on the president to rescue the Jews, Wise was outraged. He was bothered both because he thought it would, um, it would irritate and, uh, and harm the president, and because he was afraid, as he said privately, that such newspaper ads might uh, provoke anti-Semitism. Now, it is, of course, the responsibility of a, of a Jewish leader to soberly assess um, dangers and threats, both to the American Jew Jewish community and, and, and Jews abroad. So it was part of Wise's job to, to try to size up whether there were dangers um, of provoking anti-Semitism. The, the problem, I would suggest, is that when Wise was confronted with evidence that his judgment had been mistaken, mm -hmm. he nevertheless did not change his perspective. And here's what I mean. Here's a, here's a, 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 a strong example of that. Um, in the spring of 1943, the Bergson Group um, submitted a newspaper ad to the New York Times. The reason, by the way, the, 
the Bergson Group had to um, pay for ads was because the New York Times was refusing to give adequate, co- adequate coverage to the mass murder of the Jews um, in its news pages. For any of you who think the New York Times is any different today than it was 75 years ago, rest assured, at least there's some consistency here. So because the Times was burying and ignoring news about the mass murders, the, the Bergson Group had to pay for advertising space. And they did. And during the period we're talking about, the Bergson Group sponsored more than 200 full-page newspaper ads in the Times and other newspapers around the country. Um, the ad to which I'm alluding in particular was submitted with a, um, with a message that Wise and other Jewish leaders thought um, was so provocative that it could, it could cause anti-Semitism. Um, they felt that the that the that, that hex language could be perceived as anti-Christian, and so um, several of Wise's uh, colleagues called Bergson and Hecht to their offices and pleaded with them to withhold the ad because they said if this ad is published, it could provoke pogroms in the United States. Now Bergson was a newcomer. Bergson was not an American. He had come from Jerusalem in 1940. His name was not Bergson. In fact, it was. Hillel Cook, um, he and the, and the other leaders of his group, which people refer to as the Bergson Group, um, but was actually the Emergency um, Committee to Rescue the Jewish People of Europe, um, he and the other leaders of the group were foreigners. They, were, they, they were, had either come from British Mandatory Palestine or from Europe. And so in this case, they thought perhaps they should defer to the judgment of Rabbi Wise, who was, after all... Um, the elder statesman of American Jewry. And if he and his colleagues felt that this could cause pogroms, maybe they were going too far. So what Bergson did is he, he agreed to withhold the publication of the ad. It hadn't been published immediately because there was a wartime um, shortage of newsprint, newspaper um, uh, pages. So the New York Times kind of put it in line. While it was waiting in line, the events which I'm describing uh, transpired. So Bergson agreed to, to withdraw the ad. He said on condition that the major Jewish groups um, make the issue of rescue more prominent on their agenda. And they verbally said, sure, we'll do that. And then the months went by. And as the months went by, Bergson um, became convinced that, in fact, the major established groups, led by Wise and others, were still not making rescue their priority. Um, And so eventually the ad was published. It was published that fall. Well, needless to say, the appearance of this so-called anti-Christian ad did not provoke any pogroms. It's at that point that one would expect Rabbi Wise to realize that perhaps he, his fears of anti-Semitism were somewhat exaggerated. Mm-hmm. The American public was not waiting to pounce on, uh, on Jews in, in the streets of New York because of some newspaper ad. Uh, a second good example of this, by the way, is the famous march by 400 rabbis to the White House just before Yom Kippur in 1943. This was also the brainchild of the Bergson Group, um, but organized together with the Vad HaTzalah, which was an Orthodox rescue group based in New York. Uh, demonstrating at the White House was something which was unthinkable to American Jews in the 1940s. Of course, today it's commonplace, but in those days, you, they did not, nobody did that. And keep in mind that most American Jews were either immigrants or the children of immigrants, and they were still, to a significant extent, nervous about their place in American society. So they didn't think that they could go marching to the White House with their narrow Jewish demands to help, you know, their brethren in Europe. Um, but by the autumn of 1943, the Bergson Group and the Vat Hatzala had reached the conclusion that the time had come for something unprecedented, and that would be to actually march to the White House. And they mobilized more than 400 Orthodox rabbis to come from all around the country, uh, mostly from New York, but also from other cities. Um, and to march through the streets of Washington and to go right up to the gates of the White House to plead with the president to do something to rescue the Jews. Now, Rabbi Wise and other established Jewish leaders um, were aware in advance that this march was being planned, and they tried desperately to persuade the Bergson people to call it off. Again, on the grounds that if you do something so provocative, um, have a, you know, hundreds of rabbis in with their beards and long black coats and black hats, these very Jewish-looking Jews marching through the streets of Washington that it could cause pogroms in the U.S. Well, the rabbis marched anyway. Um, 
and they did go up to the gates of the White House, and the president refused to see them. They wanted to deliver a petition. The petition was calling on him to take steps to rescue Jewish refugees, and they gave very specific examples of things that could be done, um, including, by the way, using those empty ships to bring refugees back for temporary haven in America and other steps. When they reached the gates of the White House, they were told by a low-level official that the president um, was too busy to see them. He had other, other, um, other appointments occupying him that day. And it's the middle of a war, so of course he's a very busy man. And they had, rabbis had no reason to believe otherwise, so they were turned away. But we today know the truth about the president's schedule that afternoon because the president's daily list of appointments is a matter of public record. Historians um, discovered this long ago, that in fact the president had a remarkably light schedule that day. He had lunch with the Secretary of State um, at, uh, at 1 o'clock, and then he didn't have another appointment until 4 o'clock. The rabbis arrived at the White House at 2 o'clock that afternoon. So he could have given them a few minutes of his time. Why did the rabbis, um, why were the rabbis turned away? Why were they snubbed? by the president? Well, the answer is because when a president grants somebody an audience, a meeting, um, he gives their cause legitimacy. He draws attention to their demands. And that's what the president did not want to do. FDR did not want to draw any more attention to the plight of the Jews in Europe or the pressure by these American rabbis um, to do that on his administration to do something about it. The president actually left the White House for a rear exit um, in order to avoid seeing or being seen by the 400 rabbis uh, across the street. He thought he could avoid the rabbis and their, and their, um, and their cause um, by sneaking out of the White House, in effect. But ultimately, it turned out it backfired because in a very surprising development, the rabbis... Um, when, when they were informed that the president would not even grant them five minutes of his time, they openly criticized the president to reporters who were there covering this event. And they, and they said they could not imagine that, for example, 400 Catholic priests would have been snubbed the way they were snubbed, that they would have received such a cold, cold shoulder from the president when they had come such a great distance and were only asking for a few minutes of his time. This, too, was unprecedented. We said that marching to the White House was unprecedented for American Jews, the idea of Jews criticizing President Roosevelt in public was almost unheard of. And yet the situation had become so desperate that these rabbis, who they were not Republicans, they were not critics of the president, they were just there to plead for, for their government to take some minimal steps, not undermine the war effort, but just something, some, something to help um, the Jews who were being murdered um, by the Germans and their collaborators. And so when they complained, when these rabbis complained to the reporters about this, it became a front page news story, exactly what the president and his advisors, including his Jewish advisors, had been hoping to avoid. It became an issue. It was literally on the front pages of the next morning's Washington newspapers. But did that change anything? What I describe in my book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is that that was the beginning of a, um, of a remarkable series of events which catalyzed Congress to take an interest in the plight of the Jews, led to congressional debates about rescue, um, led to the introduction of a resolution that the Bergson Group um, uh, brought about, a resolution calling on the president to create a new government agency just to rescue Jewish refugees. The Bergson Group realized, just as Rabbi Wise realized, that as long as the State Department was in charge of immigration and, and refugee policy, that nothing would ever happen, um, and that nothing would ever be done to help the Jews. So they believed that the answer was to take the whole refugee issue out of the hands of the State Department and put it in the, in the lap of a government agency whose only purpose would be to rescue refugees. And did that work? The Roosevelt administration fought against the resolution tooth and nail, and they sent um, one, of their, the, one of the State Department's top refugee um, officials, experts, Breckenridge Long, to Capitol Hill to testify against the resolution. And he almost succeeded in killing it. He testified that, in fact, the U.S. had taken many steps quietly to help um, Jews escape the Nazis. And he said that more than 500,000 Jews had come 
to America. Um, he said Jewish refugees had come to America since the Nazis rose to power. So America was already rescuing the Jews. There was no need to do anything. And the members of Congress who heard this uh, assumed he was telling the truth, and they shelved the resolution. They voted to set the resolution aside and not even vote on it. The problem was that Breckenridge Long, Assistant Secretary of State Breckenridge Long, was in fact lying. That number of, 500, of over 500,000 was a wild exaggeration. It referred to all um, immigrants, not just refugees, not even just Jews, who had come to America um, since 1933. So he, he had presented deliberately uh, false statistics in order to mislead Congress. That, in turn, set off a huge public controversy. And interestingly, um, the exposure of, of Breckenridge Long's uh, lies also forced the mainstream Jewish organizations, led by Rabbi Wise, to speak out. Because this was simply too much. Um, mm -hmm. To have a government official blatantly lying um, in order to try to obstruct rescue possibilities uh, was too much even for Jewish leaders who otherwise were very cautious and were loyal to the administration. So um, the controversy forced Wise's hand in a way he had not anticipated. So by the end of 1943 and beginning of 1944, the rescue issue had become the subject of major public debate. Um, it wasn't just Bergson against, against the Roosevelt administration. Now you had the major Jewish leaders on record um, speaking out about, um, about the failure to rescue, of course, in much more cautious terms than the activists did, but still. Um, the, um, the political, um, the political um, debate, the contours of the debate had changed in a very significant way because now it seemed to the public, to Congress, that in effect almost all American Jews were opposed to the government's policy. The government had a policy. The policy was not called the abandonment of the Jews, although it might as well have been. But um, the White House had developed what we would today would call a soundbite to answer any, any critics who would, would dare question why refugees were not being aided and why the U.S. Was, uh, seemed unconcerned about the whole uh, issue of the, of the persecution of the Jews. The soundbite was rescue through victory. It meant there was no way to actually rescue Jews, is what mm -hmm. the president and his advisor claimed. There was no way to rescue the Jews except by achieving victory on the battlefield. That, that was, nothing could be done until the war was won. Of course, Jewish refugee advocates said they said and they said openly, "How many Jews will be left alive if we have to postpone rescue until mm -hmm. the day of victory?" But that was the the saying, the soundbite of the administration: "Rescue through victory." There's a similar debate that was going on at the time within Israel between the different groups there, whether because the British weren't letting the Jews into the mandate area as well, they'd slam the doors shut. So there's a difference between the groups in Israel over whether we should be fighting the British because they're not letting the Jews in or leaving the British alone because they're fighting the Germans in Europe, and that's a bigger thing. So there's a lot, I mean, it's going on on both sides of the sea. Yes, and, and in fact, the whole question of, um, of the future of Palestine also does figure very much into this story, and I explained it in more detail in the book. Um, President Roosevelt was not a supporter of Zionism, and he had no real um, sympathy for the idea of creating a Jewish state. He paid lip service to it when, um, when Jewish leaders would ask him to send, let's say, a message of greetings to a Zionist dinner. But in fact, um, he had no genuine interest in it. And when Jewish leaders, including Rabbi Wise, privately, politely asked him to pressure the British to open the doors of Palestine to Jews trying to escape from the Nazis, um, he made no effort in, in that respect during the course of, of the war. Um, his attitude was that uh, he did not want to upset the British, his allies, so he was not going to pressure them, even though Palestine was the, you know, the logical uh, haven for the Jews. Eretz Israel not to mention on. the promised one from the League of Nations, etc., and the Balfour Declaration and all of that that is way beyond this interview, but that I hope my listeners know much about. Yes, but even from a strictly geographic point of view, it would have made much more sense for Jewish refugees to be allowed into Eretz Israel as opposed to um, them having to cross the Atlantic and find haven in, say, the United States. But well, and if he didn't want the immigrants in the United States, then at least have them go somewhere else. Or, or does he not want them anywhere? And that's, that's the bottom line that we keep coming to. Um, 
I, I highly recommend my listeners that you read this book. As you can tell just from this last hour, there is so much more that's going on here, so much more detail. We've just gotten a little bit of, uh, of, of what the tremendous research that Dr. Medoff has put into this. And just, I mean, one last question before we go off. How come this book never came out earlier? Um, it's 75 years, 80 years until, since these events have happened. Is it that archives were sealed up until now? And you said that already, you know, when you were younger, this is, this is the question that was always in your mind. Why, why, why? And finally now in 2019, the book has come out. What took so long? First of all, the evidence about President Roosevelt's private views of Jews, which is critical mm -hmm. to the case I make in this book, is much of that evidence has come out um, only relatively recently. Um, in some cases, it was found almost by accident. Um, the, in general, though, um, this book follows in the footsteps. It builds on the work of previous historians. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate to have uh, worked very closely for many years with Professor David Wyman, and we collaborated on an earlier book about the Bergson Group. Um, and so, uh, of course, my work is, is informed and deeply influenced by the um, important research done by earlier scholars. But what I've done is um, I've built on that and explored other areas that uh, previous historians did not go into deeply, um, looked at archives that were not yet opened, um, and synthesized material which until now was not necessarily understood as being part of um, a coherent picture. Like the Japanese being interred, in interred at the same time. Yes, the connection between Roosevelt's attitudes towards the Japanese Americans and his attitude towards the Jews is one of the important new um, arguments that I bring forth and the, the new evidence that this book presents and which uh, sets it apart from earlier histories of the period. Uh, broadly speaking, um, this book looks at America's response to the Holocaust um, from a somewhat different perspective than earlier works. Here I look at Roosevelt's response to the Nazi genocide, specifically, specifically through the prism of his relationship with Rabbi Wise. So this is a story of two towering figures of the era um, and how um, their relationship framed and affected the American response to the mass murder of the Jews during the Holocaust. And if one comes out with an idea that FDR manipulated Rabbi Weiss to a great degree, uh, that's definitely something that I pulled out of here. Um, of course, we can jump in and have another three-hour conversation about how this relates today to a lot of the things going on with current administrations, Democrats, Republicans, things going on in the Middle East, things going on, the tremendous rise in anti-Semitism that we have, this frightening rise now in the United States. And if it can be stopped, how the attitudes play in, uh, there is so much that's happening here. And I think that your new book at least clarifies, at least for me, um, what happened decades ago. But as I would imagine that as a renowned historian, um, I think the, the reason that some people go into history, perhaps, is not just learn about history, but also the lessons from history that can be applied until today. So maybe if you have a couple of words about that, and I know that's a ridiculous thing to ask of you, um, but what, because it's just such an enormous subject, um, before we sign off. Well, the Holocaust, as we know, was not the last genocide. Um, every generation of Americans um, has to confront similar uh, similar crises and similar moral dilemmas, whether it was Cambodia, Darfur, um, and, and, or other human rights crises, ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, and so on. Um, every generation of Americans um, wrestle with the question of, does America have a responsibility to intervene when innocent people are being killed, uh, killed abroad? How far should the United States go? Should it use its power for moral purposes um, and for moral aims, not just for, um, for a strategic or military or economic advantage. Um, there is today a broad consensus, I think, in American society that America should make an effort where it can, not necessarily going to war to rescue people in other countries from oppression, but at least taking some action, not, not turning a blind eye. For example, um, recently when the United States um, carried out missile strikes on, uh, on Syrian um, Syrian chemical weapons factories it had very broad public support. Um, so did uh, so did the rescue of the Yazidis when they were about to be massacred by uh, by ISIS just a few years ago. So um, the American public today um, is intrigued and uh, and 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 
debates this question of whether or not or how America should respond. So there are very important lessons from the 1930s and 1940s when we explore how President Roosevelt responded, the opportunities that, that he had to rescue Jews, uh, things that could have been done but were not done. Um, they very often provide us with lessons and with models. Um, in this case, for the, a, a model of how not to behave mm -hmm. when there's an opportunity to rescue innocent people from mass murder. And of course, what we have today that they didn't have in the 1930s and 40s is you have the state of Israel, which can be a haven for Jews, but has also unfortunately become the lightning rod for anti-Semitism. And that is another entire debate. Dr. Raphael Madoff, thank you so much for joining me today. And again, where can people get this book if uh, hopefully we've intrigued them enough to want to pick it up and read it for themselves? Uh, the book is available on Amazon. It is also available for purchase um, in Israel bookstores in Israel. To learn more about the work of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies, you can visit our website, which is www.wymaninstitute.org. So we have The Jews Should Keep Quiet, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Rabbi Stephen S. Weiss, and the Holocaust by Dr. Raphael Medoff, M-E-D-O-F-F. -F. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Land of Israel Network. Thanks for having me. Hanukkah Sameach to all of our listeners. Let's keep our lights shining bright. Happy Hanukkah from the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Hi, this is Gil Hoffman, host of Inside Israel Today. Happy Hanukkah.